I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Mary Wilde, Freudian cinephile and host of the Projection series at the Freud Museum, London. You can find her events on the Freud Museum's website, freud.co.uk. She's also co-host of Projections Podcast with Sarah Cleaver. You can find those episodes at projectionspodcast.com. Mary Wilde is one of the participants in our upcoming Psychoanalysis Art and the Occult series. You can visit psychartcult.org for information and links to all the events, or go directly to Morbid Anatomy online to register at morbidanatomy.org slash events. The first event in the series will be myself and Isabel Millar. We'll be speaking on September 5th at 2 p.m. New York City time, which is 11 a.m. in Los Angeles, 7 p.m. in London, and 20 in Central European Standard Time. On September 5th, Isabel Millar will be presenting Artificial Intelligence and the Patti Political Body, and I will be talking about Freud's explorations of the occult. Then, Mary Wilde is featured in the second event on the series, which is Sunday, September 12th, at the same time. Mary's going to be presenting on taxidermy in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, and there will also be a discussion with writer and director Anna Biller of The Love Witch and Viva. Then the following Sunday, September 19th, we have Peter Gray and Alkistis Demek of Scarlet Imprint presenting the two Antichrists on Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard and their Babylon working. So it's aerospace, Scientology, and witchcraft. Who can beat that? And then the final event in the series is Blanche Barton on death imagery in Satanism and Carl Abrahamson with Memento Mori Forever on Sunday, September 26th. Visit psychartcult.org, that's P-S-Y-C-H-A-R-T-C-U-L-T dot org for links and more information. And be sure to follow Mary Wild on Twitter at Psychstar, P S Y C S T A R. That's Psychstar on Twitter and Instagram. Mary Wild also has a new Patreon, which is fantastic. I'm a subscriber. She puts out great content every week. So visit patreon.com slash Mary Wild. You can support the podcast at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. That's V A N E S S A 2 3 C A R L. Your support is very appreciated. Thank you so much for supporting Rendering Unconscious Podcast and all of my other creative endeavors. Um, I don't even know what we're talking about today, Mary. Did you have anything specific you wanted to start with? <laughs> I oh, just wanted well, Mary on. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that, I'm honored to uh, be reinvited on your podcast, Vanessa. It's so nice to be back. Yeah, um, well, we're, we're the star. You've gotten me through the whole pandemic with all of your 
projections classes oh, like, been my entire ent entertainment is watching those and then watching the films in preparation for those thank you so much i'm ple really pleased that it's uh, been enjoyable for you i really want to thank you as always for attending you're such a good cheerleader honestly like you always encourage me um i feel so supported by you so thank you well, i love what you do and i was thinking the last time we talked was about the freud netflix series right yeah. so that was early on in the pandemic yeah that's right it was it feels like a million years ago now that we recorded that and it was it was like in the early stages of the pandemic um i guess i wanted to talk a little bit about um i suppose like because I, you know, something occurred to me when I heard a lot of discourse around people isolating, and I couldn't help but think that the physical distance that we were told we had to have was kind of, in a way, it had already been there, you know, uh, because people are just so atomized these days. There's, they're so, they're so apart in in so many ways. They're sort of very isolated. Mm -hmm. And so when the pandemic struck, I didn't really notice a huge difference in my lifestyle, you know, like, because I would, it, it, maybe I would go like many months before between seeing some friends, or if I did go out, it would be usually by on my own, um, going to the cinema, you know, uh, things like that. And I don't know how, what it, what what was that like for you? I guess it's it's such a because I can't help but think like that the way that the Western economic model is set up is is it doesn't is not like that collect um, community building anyway. No, it's not. I mean, I definitely was already working from home and home most of the time, so for me, it really wasn't that big of a difference. Um, definitely not like other people who like were working and then started working from home or had kids that were in school and then uh, their kids were home doing homeschool and all of this like there are so many things people had to deal with that really were weren't a part of my life because I work from home any, anyway and don't go out anyway <laughs> so um, and that way it really wasn't hasn't been that different yeah yeah exactly I mean um yeah, I, I just, I guess I'm just kind of like reflecting on even now, because I feel like we're very much in a stage of the pandemic where the messaging around it is so ambivalent. We don't know whether we are supposed to be going out or staying home. Um, are we in lockdown or not? Like we're just like teetering this strange line, you know? And it makes me second guess a lot of like social obligations that I'm invited to or, so, or not I shouldn't say obligations just social functions that I'm invited to and I'm, my, my knee-jerk response is just to say no <laughs> I'm not interested um, maybe that's just because I mean maybe I'm just an extreme case because I am so introverted and I'm quite happy just on my own um, but I, I hate the thought of uh like I feel like before I was a I was a like an active introvert in terms of I just decided when I wanted to stay home it was my choice it wasn't already made for me I already had autonomy over that decision whereas now I feel like I'm more of a passive introvert in the sense that I, I've kind of resigned myself to a culture of viewing other human beings out in the world as vectors for a virus and super spreaders <laughs> um and that's not a nice thing you know like I wouldn't want I don't want to be in that position I'd rather you know I don't know if that makes sense that makes sense and I mean yeah. I'm the same way I'm pretty introverted in that way as well despite right my, my external persona might seem like um and I've, I've always been really happy doing my own thing or going out by myself or, you know, I, I've just kind of always been like that. So, um, yeah, I don't really feel the need to socialize that much. And even in New York, I mean, when my social life was like really active, it was mostly doing events like the Morbid Anatomy. Morbid mm -hmm. Anatomy used to be 
uh, a br brick and mortar building in in Brooklyn, and I used to do events there, things like that. So I was busy running around doing those kinds of activities, but it was mostly like work related, at least kinds of events and things. Um, and then of course we go out to dinner afterwards and socialize and network that way. But um, in general, I'm totally fine being on my own. I love reading. I'm totally happy to stay home and, and read. And mm -hmm. I think I think in general. You know, I mean, I think the U.S. is a perfect example of people rushing too fast to kind of go back to this whatever quote unquote normal thing that people want to go back to. When I think we should really keep in mind, like the beginning of the pandemic, when people were posting all these kind of animal videos and being like, look, you know, you can see yeah. the is where you couldn't see that for so long because of pollution and stuff like that. And like, be like, the earth is better off if we all like chill out a little bit and stay home a little bit and like don't rush to jump on a plane. I mean, so many friends of mine or colleagues that I saw online, like immediately just like jumped on planes and went to islands and just like went traveling. And, and to me, it's just like, I mean, clearly they jumped the gun because now there's, you know, a whole bunch of more problems again. And I just really think people should just stay home as much as possible because some people can't stay home. People, some people have to go to work. Some people are essential workers and have to go yeah. to hospitals and things. But I think if you can stay home, you know, it's, you should, I think we all should. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I think we would just get a better hold on the spread if people just um, curtailed their socializing. And um, I mean, I look at like New Zealand, my husband's from New Zealand and you know, they shut down the whole country after they found one case in the in, like community case. And a lot of, I saw a lot of people online like saying that that was excessive and that became a bit of a joke, but. But they stopped it. They stopped it. Yeah. They got yeah. a complete hold on it. And in the long run, isn't that better for the state of everything? Everything. It's reopen and they can know in good faith that you know, they've got a hold on the situation rather than just this strange, like ambivalent fence sitting situation that we're in where I, I truly don't know what the messaging is anymore. Like I don't even try to figure it out because there's so, there's so many mixed messages. Yeah, I mean, there's something, there was definitely a point in the media in the United States where all of a sudden they just cleared the pandemic over and told everyone to go out because literally like everyone I know in the States, no matter who they were, and these are people that did not know each other, all of a sudden were like, well, the pandemic's over now. <laughs> it's like, really? Yeah. Because it's not. Um, so it's definitely like media in different places is telling people different things. Um yeah, and I think that, you know, it's just because corporations and governments want to boost the economy and have people spending and consuming and traveling to boost the economy. Um, mm -hmm. And I think they're using people's kind of cabin fever from being cooped up for a year. You know, they're, they're like playing on that and telling people to go out and do things and people are itching to go out and do things and so they're doing it. But I don't think we should listen to those uh, corporate corporations and governments because they really just want to stimulate the economy and they're putting money money making over life and that's not good no it's not it's really not um i mean actually uh i'm just glad that you um recently you you invited me to write a, a book chapter with you um yes. and um I, I don't know if we're allowed to like talk about that at all or um I think so yeah yeah uh, I mean obviously without naming the prospective um publishers and stuff it was more generally to speak on the fact that the topic the topic really intrigued me like when you said that um it's really a book about the changing ways in which we approach um our, our kind of I guess, visual art consumption or TV or movie consumption mm. uh, in the pandemic and our relationship to screens, really. And the fact that there's been this just kind of radical shift from the silver screen, the big screen of the cinema, you know, uh, and kind of in vivo situation of actually being in a movie theater as an outing, as like a discrete event from what's going on inside your home to then constantly just being in one space and that's where you consume everything and how it's kind of competing with other screens all the time mm -hmm. 
and it really got me thinking like I think I firstly think I have to thank you for asking me to write that chapter with you because it kind of gave me something productive to do um, uh, and made me think more deeply and more like intentionally and unconsciously about maybe something that I'd been doing maybe on almost like autopilot um, and it just really got me thinking about how mesmerizing smaller screens can be and how they can just easily become so insidious and we don't even realize how mm. much we're engaging we call it multitasking because because that makes us feel good as if we're being we're doing something positive we're able to juggle multiple tasks at the same time but what it's actually doing is splitting our attention and diluting it um, from truly experiencing like the work of art, which is the cinema. Mm -hmm. Being in that, uh, in, I guess the isolation chamber, like the sensory deprivation chamber of the cinema uh, compels the viewer to only focus on one thing. And so it really facilitates suspension of disbelief and I feel like we we can't have that at the moment it's impossible no and that way the cinema is just really like all immersive work of art it yeah. immerses all your senses yeah yeah exactly it's um like something funny happened to me on my first cinema outing since the lockdown like I went very um I guess, wait, how can you say? Like, I went in very cautiously. I was masked. I sat alone, you know, like I made sure there was plenty of distance between me and other people. And I was very, I was a little bit worried. Um, but what also occurred for me is that, because I have to have this procedure for my hearing, um, like once a year, it's called like microsection. And it kind of makes it, over time, my hearing gets a little dulled and the microsection just completely refreshes my hearing and it clarifies every sound. And I'm like back to like optimum hearing again. But prior to having my like yearly procedure of microsection done, um, I had a lot of like buildup around my ears and like I could feel that I was, my hearing was very dulled and like muted. Mm -hmm. And when I went into the cinema, it was supposed to be like this, like, um, what's the word? Like this uh, euphoric moment of me returning to the cinema, being reunited with like my sacred space, but I could barely hear anything. <laughs> so it, was like, it was so anticlimactic. Like I just sat in my seat. I, I guess I thought that, sh I thought surely this, the, the like super sophisticated sound system at the cinema will override my hearing issue at the moment you know that I'm waiting to correct but no it didn't it just sounded really dulled and I couldn't help but think oh I wish I this could be subtitled because for a few weeks prior to that I'd just been subtitling everything at home so I could I could kind of get by and it, it made me kind of it was kind of an un uncanny experience to be back in a space where I knew I could achieve suspension of disbelief, but I was still distracted. There was still this obstacle preventing me from fully surrendering to the experience. And I still was like trying to work out what was said. And um, anyway, thank goodness, like a week later, I had the problem resolved, uh, but it, it kind of, I guess, drove home the point more and more that there, there does need to be this, um, like commitment to something, uh, to a work of art, whatever that may be, it doesn't have to be the cinema. And it requires a, a certain level of presence that I feel like we're unlearning because of the pandemic. Yeah, and I feel like also like with all the different screens, you know, people watching TV on one screen, Apple TV and have the computer and have the phone and really like, even just one kind of splits your attention because everything's so fragmented, you're just dumping from like headline to headline, picture to picture, and scrolling. Um, and I can definitely tell the 
uh, difference in my like concentration ability and stuff like that just from like uh, being on the computer this much because I actually like you know well when I was in New York I had a private practice I saw people all day you know yeah. people in the flesh in a room for eight hours I've never I've never really had like an office job or anything where I've been on the computer this much um, and I can really tell that it's how it affects my attention. So I really try to, when I'm done with like work for the day, just like, you know, call my parents or whoever, and then like sign off of everything, close the computer, close the phone, and then just have like dedicated time to like reading or being in the house or doing other things. And it helps me to like have things in blocks in that way, because this like constant, like fragmenting attention really, really affects my attention for a while. I'm always been a big reader. And for a while, I just like, couldn't read more than a few pages at a time before I got distracted with something else. And I really like, like this past weekend, I read this book, which you might love, actually, it's this woman named Makita Brotman. She's been on the podcast a couple of times. Oh, yeah. Um, she writes about true crime, but like from a psychoanalytic perspective. But she also wrote this book that I cannot believe I did not know about before. But I knew that Carl had known of her work because she had written something that he had read about like spiritualist photography and that sort of thing. So she, so we knew that she had this like occult leaning, but like I hadn't known any books of hers that she'd written about that. I'd only known her like true kind of stuff. And she, she teaches at Maryland Institute for Contemporary Art. So I'd known about her work with like you know, art and psychoanalysis and that kind of thing. But she wrote this book called Phantoms of the Clinic that's from thought transference to projective identification. And she talks all about like Freud being into telepathy and all of that whole thing. It's a whole book about it. And I was like, where has this book been all my life? <laughs> um, it apparently came out in 2011. So like this weekend, I made a, it was chilly enough that I made a fire in the fireplace and I just sat like literally all day Saturday and most of the day Friday. And I just read the entire book in two days by the fire. That's like my dream. I just loved it so much. It's like, that's me at my like peak moment. I love it. Oh my God. That sounds like a dream. It is. <laughs> I want more of that in my life. So I try to make that kind of thing happen whenever possible. Oh, wow. I love that. <laughs> We should talk too about you um, yeah. going to be at Morbid Anatomy Museum oh, yeah. and, and your talk on taxidermy and psycho. Oh my goodness. I am so excited. I can't tell you. Um, again, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in that program. The whole program looks incredible. Um, it's going to be really fun. It's going to be amazing. Uh, it's just so unique and well thought out. Um, I, yeah, I mean, first of all, it's, I mean, sorry, I should say the, the, the concept of also appearing at this event alongside Anna Biller is yes. um, wonderful. I mean, it is like, I couldn't have dreamed of an opportunity like that because I'm a big fan of hers. She is one of the all-time greats in terms of being an auteur and having just complete control of her vision and being so in touch with every aspect of her filmmaking. It's not just direction, it's everything, costume, makeup, um, you know, just set design, uh, cinematography, editing, marketing, like she's just such a pro and so committed. I, do, I love her work. So I'm honored to, appear alongside her in an event. I mean, in terms of my own talk with, um, I decided to do something on Alfred Hitchcock's film Psycho, obviously. Um, I guess what led me to choose that is the notion of being feeling compelled to reanimate, you know, the dead. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the maternal dead and what this means for the character Norman Bates. Um, I don't think it's as straightforward because I've seen some critiques of Psycho that are very modern. And some people have said that Psycho is one of the kind of like um, early films that was kind of transphobic because it was a guy in a dress, you know? <laughs> um, but. I don't really see it that way at all. I think that's too reductive. I think it's not that he 
felt um, it, it's not like a film um, warning people about the dangers of gender fluidity. That's not the issue. It's not so random, you know. No, it's, it's actually, his mother. It's his mother. You know? <laughs> it's a difference. Exactly. It's a very specific woman that mm-hmm. he's like emulating or conjuring up. He has to act out something in relation to his mother. And I guess my the the, the center piece of um, or the center point of my talk is around like revolves around this notion of stuffing dead animals and mounting them on the wall being kind of tantamount to the compulsion to reanimate the dead mother um and there's something there that's very close to like violence and you know suppressed sexuality and uh yeah i suppose just kind of a gen a genuine confusion about you know norman bates feeling genuinely at sea and confused about his own nature like he hasn't had the luxury to have what most people have which is kind of to figure things out for themselves he had a very overbearing mother you know um yeah I suppose I mean I like the concept of the overbearing mother in cinema I see it a lot popping up in other films like obviously Black Swan um but also Tom Six's film um in the Human Centipede trilogy, like the second film. Uh, now that is a horror film. <laughs> I haven't seen the Human Centipede. I remember the in one of the projection series, you you showed the um, what is it from Dead Alive? The that mother and her ear falls off in the soup, and oh, she turns yeah. into this like giant, giant mother thing. <laughs> Brain dead. <laughs> Brain dead. Yeah, the Jackson film Brain Dead. Highly recommend for all of your your, your psychoanalytically minded <laughs> listeners. This is the ultimate Oedipus complex movie. Brain dead. Um, it is it, that film is just crazy. It's bonkers. I mean, it is a, technically a zombie movie, but I would say it's more like it has like slapstick elements in there. There's a bit of like comedy. So it, even though it is kind of revolting to watch or some disgusting <laughs> bits in it um i think that the violence can be taken with a pinch of salt it's not intended to to the violence is not intended to be rich uh, naturalistic or true to life so you can kind of engage with it in a humor humorful way you know um yeah when i was in high school i had this friend in my senior year of high school that lived up the street from me named manny and i have seen that movie so many times because of him because he was just like we would just sit in his bedroom and you know his, his parents house and smoke cigarettes and watch zombie movies all day it's like all he wanted to do and uh it, we watched the movie so many times and he would he was like one of those guys who would like pause it and rewind it and make us watch like scenes over and over again and he would point out like when you could see the actual like streams of blood being like shot in from the side of the screen instead of like coming out of like the person who got hit with the axe or whatever he'd be like look look the blood's coming from over here so I've seen like that movie like played and rewound like <laughs> I can't even tell you how many times <laughs> <laughs> so it's really funny to vi- revisit it in uh, in your projections because I hadn't thought of it in a long time. Oh. It also reminded me there used to be when I lived in Florida. Um, I flew up to New York one weekend yeah. just to see this play, it was off Broadway play that was a a play that they made of the Evil Dead, and oh. they actually had it. It was from Canada, I think. It came down to New York off Broadway, and somebody had mentioned this to me, and I was like, "Wait, this is a play." of the evil dead and they were like yeah and the first two rows the tickets were only like 25 dollars if you sat in one of the first two rows because the first two rows were called the splatter section and they would actually just like throw like fake fake blood on everyone in the audience and they asked you to wear all white so when you like came out of this play you're like covered in this like red fake blood and i'm serious and it was amazing And apparently it just had like a six week run or something. It's like they had scheduled it and like it flopped and nobody went and they and it got canceled. And I was, I couldn't believe it, but I was so glad. I literally flew up like on a Friday and then came back to Florida on a Sunday just to go see this play. I think it was like in 2006. Um, and it was amazing. It was like one of the best things I've ever seen. It's just absolutely fantastic. 
oh wow that sounds like so much fun I it love was so that fun like, we I could not get a cab afterwards <laughs> like standing there looking like we were covered in blood we were trying oh to like get a cab God. back <laughs> that's hilarious I love those cin- cinematic like experiences that are so immersive and you're actually encouraged as an audience member to like act out it's like a psychodrama you know it's so like, fun um it's like it's like those you know like have you heard of those therapy sessions where it's like group therapy and everyone like screams and mm-hmm. like I don't know what they're called but um there's a very performance-based therapy like you're meant to like actively physically perform in your in your process um I I actually think it comes from some ancient Greek practice where citizens of ancient Greek Greece would actually seek out these like uh social situations that were conducted for the purpose of catharsis like they actually use the word catharsis like it's obviously the, the word as we know it now originates from the ancient Greece um times and they they were they just wanted to like let something out you know through this ritualistic collective performance and I feel like today's uh immersive cinema events are kind of like that there there's you there's something going on there that's not just enter- entertainment or escapism you're kind of working through something Absolutely. I've been thinking too, I mean, since since my friend Jessica was killed last year, I've been like much more sensitive, to like violence and in the film and stuff like that. But I've also been thinking like I, I'm it's getting better now, but when it was first like really bothering me, I was thinking, you know, why do people watch so many violent movies? Like why do like like we finally are, we're like we're not living in forests, we're like pretty safe in our houses generally, you know, we we don't have to worry as much about a lot of outside kind of elements, you know, invading yeah. us and scaring us or killing us. Um, but then we like are in these like little safe like spaces that we've created and then we watch all this violence, you know, <laughs> it must be something <laughs> cathartic to it. There must be something in us that's like, I don't know, either processing or just has the need for this kind of excitement or danger or who knows. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I was wondering also, I wanted to ask you something too, um, just in terms of like, just going back to the morbid anatomy um, events about what kind of early response are you getting from prospective attendees? Because it's just such a rich program. And I also was curious about like your inspiration in terms of creating this series. Yeah, sure. Well, I have no idea what the what the um what what who's coming or anything like that because that's all handled by Morbid Anatomy. I, I really that. don't know. Um, I know when when the series started in Brooklyn. The fun the fun thing is that the very first Morbid Anatomy, I mean, the very first psychoanalysis art in the occult event was actually at Morbid Anatomy in Brooklyn in January of 2016. And it was the day after David Bowie had died. So I was up all night upset because like I, I checked Instagram like right before I went to bed that night and just saw on his Instagram like that he had died and I, and I, I felt like it wasn't real. I'm like, that's not real. What is that? And then I guess a lot of people felt that way because it was like a whole evening of like everyone like processing the fact that David Bowie had died online. So I was up like all night um, because of that. And his record, the Black Star album had just come out like the weekend yeah. before and I had been, there was this record store uh, in the Lower East Side that, that I always went to. It was my favorite. Um, it's called In Living Stereo. And there's uh, Ramsey Jones works there. And he's a cousin of like Jizza and Rizza. Really? And like, yeah. And he, cool. and he, he, yeah, he's their drummer and he tours with them when they play live and that sort of thing. Um, and he's like the most fun person ever in the world to talk to. Like you, I would just go to the record store and like hang out with Ramsey all day and like talk. Um, and he just has like amazing stories and amazing taste. And he's always dressed like, you know, to the nines. And he dresses very like 70s with like suede bell bottom pants and like, you know, like a hat with like a feather in it. And he's just like, he's phenomenal. Um, and wow. I just love Ramsey. So that's what I did like to go get uh, Bowie's album the weekend before. 
I had gone to in living stereo to get it and hung out with Ramsey all day. And so I didn't know what to do. I was like up all night when Bowie died. And then once like it was like 10 in the morning and I like barely slept. It's like, what do I do? I'm like, I'm gonna go back to the record store. So I went back to the record store and hung out with Ramsey and then like processed all day everybody coming in to talk about how David Bowie had died so that's how I processed it was just like hanging out there and actually that record store wasn't very far from where he lived in New York so I also went down down the street and like brought roses and and a candle to his um to outside his building where people had set up like a memorial um and then I was like oh I have to give this talk (laughs) so it was really delirious but I found that I also I often give better talks when I'm really tired because I don't, I don't care so much. I'm too tired to care. So I'm like not censored, you know, and uh-huh. like my neurosis kind of goes out the door and I'm just all like, whatever, free flowing, nice. um, which is always better. Um, yeah. So that was the first event. It was me and Caitlin Foisy, my friend, who's a tarot card reader and like artist, which, and we talked about the cut up method and like how it's, now, an artistic practice but also kind of a magical practice so that was really mm-hmm. fun and then I did events um all year that year uh, like once a month I guess and I, I always like to pair two people together because I think it's fun because then they can have a dialogue as well besides you know not just with me in the audience but also with one another and then reflect on each other's work so I always find it really fun to pair people and that's why also when I when I invited Anna Biller and she agreed I was like oh my god Anna Biller and Mary Wilde together <laughs> that's a dream team for me too um and we've I'm been watching here. yeah of course and we've been watching all of her shorts and everything um wow. on her website you can you can watch her shorts on Vimeo and uh, the incubus fantastic and the hypnotist which is about like a psychoanalyst oh my god it's amazing she's just she's phenomenal and I'm just yeah. so glad I, I love her and I love her work and the more I learn about her the more I love her and mm-hmm. um yeah her aesthetic every detail in those sets is just like spot on perfect yeah Um, yeah she's just like yeah she does everything exactly how she wants you can tell it's her vision and I love that so much um and we actually call that you know the the event the last event is um Carl and Blanche Barden and Blanche Barden was Anton LaVey's partner um and so she's like one of the people who runs the Church of Satan since he's since he's since he died in 1997 and, you know, people, of course, there's a lot of misconceptions about Satanism and what it is. And, you know, uh, one of the things that we would call something that's really satanic would be like Annabella Swerk. Uh, I hope she's okay with that. But what that means is really just like people that create like total environments of their own, where it's mm-hmm. like they, they bend the world to the way they want them to be and like can kind of live in a space of their own creation. Yeah. And that, that's this kind of element where it's like, you don't have to like always be doing like what the rest of the world is doing. Uh, LeVay called them total environments. He encouraged everyone to like make your home like a total environment. So that it's kind of like your little bubble in the world and you can have it exactly how you want it and like really make it like your vision, at least somewhere like your home, like somewhere in the world should be like a little pocket that like you've created just for yourself. And I feel like her work is really like, her vision manifested and it's like all her own and it's beautiful and bright and colorful and f- super feminist and really fun and sexy and just all of the things all of the fun things absolutely yeah so subversive you know like I yes. really like that yeah I, I like I like how postmodern it is as well like um trying to uh I suppose like touch on uh, earlier aesthetics, especially like the golden age of Hollywood or the 60s, like she was really in touch with with cinema. You can tell she's a cinephile. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> we just watched The Hypnotist a couple of days ago. And it was just like, Carl's like, this could be pulled right out of the 40s. It's like, it's just like once in a while you realize, okay, no, it's current, but like, it's so spot on. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, and these events, I mean, they, I started them because in 2015, I, well, I left the hospital system in 2012, hmm. and then I just felt like, you know, people need to know what's going on in the med- American medical system and mental health system, because it's just, like, deplorable and archaic, it really needs to be changed, so yeah. I did, like, a lot of talks about that, and 
you know, the system, systemic racism and abuse and violence in, in these like mental health care facilities and, and hospitals and stuff. And then I had this like big conference in 2015 about it with my friend Manya, who I did the on violence and psychoanalysis book with. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, then after that conference, I just felt like, what did that do? Because it's like all these psychoanalysts that like live in the Upper East Side or whatever, and they're in their little offices and they don't really, uh, <laughs> they don't really interact with the rest of the world too much. And they go to these conferences and they talk to each other and it doesn't really go anywhere except for like in these little bubbles. It's like, you know, everyone comes up with great ideas and everyone's like applauds everyone else's work and how thoughtful they are. But also really, you can also tell people in the audience are always just like waiting for their turn to speak so they can say something really smart and they're not really listening to what the actual presenters are saying. And mm. I just kind of became disenchanted with this whole like, uh, like world that seemed very like nepotistic and just like in its own little bubble um, and I just felt like I I did all this work to try to present these issues that I thought were really important and everyone like applauds but I'm like what does this really do it didn't really feel like it went and like landed anywhere I just felt like kind of talking to a wall or talking out into space or something so I got kind of disenchanted after that and then I was like well if you know if this isn't helping anyway I'm just gonna do something fun and and they decided to like talk about magic and art and I was hanging out with Danny Novus at the time actually mm -hmm. after that conference he was one of the speakers at the violence conference and we were out to dinner afterwards and he was like well what are you going to do next and I was like I want to talk about mm -hmm. psychoanalysis and the occult and he's like oh you should have something like that at the Freud Museum that's when he was chairing mm -hmm. the Freud Museum and I was yeah. like, really? You'll let me have a conference about psychoanalysis and the occult at the Freud Museum? And he's like, yeah, why not? And I was like, wow, that just like opened my mind. I'm like, is that possible? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't end up being there. We ended up having it at this art gallery, Candid Arts yeah. Trust, um, but which is just like a much bigger space. And we ended up having this like art, art opening there and like having all this like magical art as well. Uh, so it turned into something else, but that kind of gave me the the spark to realize that I could actually make that happen, that that could oh. actually be a thing, and that you know uh, I wanted to see that in the world. So yes. now that's what we do. Now I kind of vacillate between like getting more political, psychoanalysis, and politics, and then like yeah. art and magic. It's like it balances me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sorry I missed this. This sounds incredible, but also I think that eventually you should definitely collaborate with the Freud Museum. I feel like you'd be a perfect fit with um, in their program. There's, you know what I mean? Like, I just think they would welcome you with open arms. That's just my belief. Yeah, it would be fun. And I have talked to Jamie about potentially doing something in the fall or something like that. Excellent. So hopefully that will happen. Oh my God, soon. I hope it does. That it would be incredible. fun. And I also have to tell you the recent projections, I love all of them, but this recent one about Marilyn Monroe, I am obsessed with her now. <laughs> really? Yeah, I can't get her out of my mind. She's just such yeah. a like beautiful, tragic figure. And I just feel like the, she evokes such emotion. Like I just feel yeah. for her so much. And I guess yeah. a lot of people do. And that's why she's Marilyn Monroe. But um, just hearing more about her story and then your like thoughtful perspective of like what was going on rather than like, like these executives being like, oh, she's difficult and that kind of thing. It's like yeah. really nice to bring that kind of thoughtful psychoanalytic considered perspective to her. And you wrote about this, didn't you? I did. So I, well, thank you very much for saying that. Um, yeah, I wrote my master's thesis actually under Danny Nobis. He was my research supervisor. Awesome. Um, at Brunel University. So there's like some interesting like coincidences there. Um, and yeah, he supervised my research on Marilyn. It was like a theoretical, uh, I guess, analysis of her persona. And I applied Lacanian theory predominantly to explore perhaps like a hysteric um, positioning um, just manifested in kind of yeah, I suppose how she related to other people, mm -hmm. her discursive position in the symbolic order, um, that she was always coming from a place of great kind of like alienation and lack due to the fact that she basically had no family growing up. Like, no, she, you know, her parents were alive, 
but she was not cared for. She kind of was shuttled around foster homes and orphanages, even though she wasn't an orphan, you know? Um, and this kind of informed how she related to herself, to other people as she developed, as she became an adult, found her place in, her, in the film industry, but this very much was governed by, yeah, just a lot of um, self-doubt, insecurity, uh, substance uh, addiction, you know, a, a lot of stuff going on there. Um, but yeah, a lot of, I feel like sh she is, uh, even though most people might not know the intricacies of her life story, there's something about her that, because even though she was like such a glamour queen and she was so gorgeous. And of course, a lot of that image was manufactured very kind of consciously and, and systematically to, pr to project her in that way. And she participated in that willingly. Um, I think the secret to her endurance and the kind of mainstream consciousness decades after she died is that traces of her suffering, her subjectivity and her sadness are detectable in her image. They kind of peek through mm. and that's relatable. That's, I think that's what reassures and comforts people that they're not alone. If she were just like a vacuous, um, you know, shallow person who didn't have a complex um, history or who wasn't that thoughtful, I just don't believe that the static image of her beauty would have such a, like, lasting power I just don't believe it would there's so many beautiful women in Hollywood and I mean I don't mean any disrespect to those ladies from the past you know golden age of Hollywood um I, I maybe they just didn't like register in the same way as she did because she was just incredibly self-reflective you know um she was kind of almost painfully aware of her existential crisis and she sought out various ways to address that she you know turned to psychoanalysis um she read a lot she talked to uh, a lot of like big names uh, at the time in her day like intellectuals she liked to be around those people like deep thinkers and she also didn't like pretentiousness so she wasn't doing it for optics. She just was genuinely a curious person. And it's just too bad. She was only 36 years old when she sadly died. I would have, I would have loved to see her really graduate in her career to mm -hmm. making more like character uh, studies. I also resent the fact that this kind of term exists in the film industry often you'll hear someone being described like an actor or something being described as like a character actor. That's, I feel like that's just a, a euphemism for saying that they're not a conventional heartthrob, you know, like they don't have, they don't possess the looks to make it as like a pinup uh, heartthrob, like A-lister or something. Mm -hmm. And so they have, they have, because they lack that, they have to like fall back on <laughs> their acting chops and <laughs> make a name for themselves as a character actor. But with Marilyn, she had it all. Like she was a great comedian. She was able to like concoct uh, an aesthetically pleasing or conventionally pleasing image. Um, she, she had that kind of raw chemistry on film she was so watchable but she could do drama as well and that wasn't heated enough I feel in her time it's too bad um she could have she could have been one of the greats like alongside Marlon Brando like at, at, in, in terms of acting she just wasn't given that opportunity yeah and that the scenes you showed like at the uh, during Misfits their last film was just like wow incredible yeah. Um, and even the old black magic. I listen to that song now all the time from that, uh, what is it called? Bus stop. Bus stop. After she be, did method acting. It's just so, it's so great. She, she really is fantastic. Yeah. I know you have to go, but I would love to see that published somehow, somewhere, sometime. Thank and you so much. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I might have 
a lead in terms of publishing it. It's our very early days, but hopefully I can negotiate something and I can put my work out there. Nice. And <laughs> also Carl has his Venice Wolf series of books. Um, so if you ever have like a little essay or something that yeah. wants a home, anything to do with psychoanalysis and art or cinema or any of that, um, it's welcome there too. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys are like the dream team, honestly. You're like an, this kind of magical, um, you know, pot of gold in terms of creativity and just kind of acceptance and wanting to lift other people around you up and encouraging people. And I'm just so happy you're out there because you're such a antidote to the kind of more toxic elements of our culture. So I just thank God for you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mary. All right, I'll let you go because I know you got to go. Thank you so much. Nice to talk to you, Vanessa. Bye, Mary. Have a good day. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Mary Wilde, Freudian cinephile and host of the Projection series at the Freud Museum, London. You can find her events on the Freud Museum's website, freud.co.uk. She's also co-host of Projections Podcast with Sarah Cleaver. You can find those episodes at projectionspodcast.com. Mary Wilde is one of the participants in our upcoming Psychoanalysis, Art, and the Occult series. You can visit psychartcult.org for information and links to all the events, or go directly to Morbid Anatomy online to register at morbidanatomy.org slash events. The first event in the series will be myself and Isabel Millar. We'll be speaking on September 5th at 2 p.m. New York City time, which is 11 a.m. in Los Angeles, 7 p.m. in London, and 20 in Central European Standard Time. On September 5th, Isabel Millar will be presenting Artificial Intelligence and the Patty Political Body, and I will be talking about Freud's explorations of the occult. Then, Mary Wilde is featured in the second event on the series, which is Sunday, September 12th, at the same time. Mary's going to be presenting on taxidermy in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, and there will also be a discussion with writer and director Anna Biller of The Love Witch and Viva. Then the following Sunday, September 19th, we have Peter Gray and Alkistis Demek of Scarlet Imprint presenting the two Antichrists on Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard and their Babylon working. So it's aerospace, Scientology, and witchcraft. Who can beat that? And then the final event in the series is Blanche Barton on death imagery in Satanism and Carl Abrahamson with Memento Mori Forever on Sunday, September 26th. Visit psychartcult.org. That's P-S-Y-C-H-A-R-T-C-U-L-T dot org for links and more information. And be sure to follow Mary Wilde on Twitter at Psychstar, P-S-Y-C-S-T-A-R. That's Psychstar on Twitter and Instagram. Mary Wilde also has a new Patreon, which is fantastic. I'm a subscriber. She puts out great content every week. So visit patreon.com slash Mary Wilde. 
Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. You can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org, for links and more information. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. You can support the podcast at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. That's V-A-N-E-S-S-A 23 C-A-R-L. Your support is very appreciated. Thank you so much for supporting Rendering Unconscious Podcast and all of my other creative endeavors. I love solitude. Being around, for me, it's physically revolting to be. I love solitude. Being around, for me, it's physically revolting to be. I love solitude. Being around, for me, it's physically revolting to be. I love solitude. Being around, for me, it's physically revolting to be. I love solitude. I love solitude. Being around, for me, it's physically revolting to be. I state categorically that the realm of the flesh, sense, matter, is an illusory form that clothes the realm of the shadow. We, the most fundamental of experiences, slide that the incarnate co substantial deep or order structure my skin as some form of agency. I love solitude. Being around for me, it's physically revolting to be. The shadow is vulnerable, abducted. We must find them again, along with an alphabet of mistrust. Vulnerable, able to separate, yet seeing an impossibility, and is to lie. The artist is in a position to connect the physical, emotional, shared so that it may ignite thoughts. We, the most fundamental of experiences, slide that the incarnate co substantial deep or order structure my skin as some form of agency.
core and must shrink. <laughs>